some of you might know this term, EDC, everyday carry. So for most people, it's at least wallet, phone, keys, right? Does anybody do that when they're leaving the house? Wallet, phone, key, wallet, keys, phone, right? Uh, at our house, we have to have everything in a bowl next to the door <laughs> so we don't forget it, right? There's been times, not too many times, but there's been times when we go out the door, click, I just locked the house and I don't have a key, <laughs> you know, or, oh, you know, I, you know, I, I, I uh, <laughs> my Tiffany will leave the house and I call and her phone rings in the house. I'm like, all right, cool, no phone. So, uh, or I'll forget my phone or my wallet or whatever. Uh, I have a couple more things that I carry though. So, this free tips now. I have a flashlight. Flashlights are great. Uh, your phone has a flashlight, but if your phone's at a battery now, you don't have a flashlight. And then also, Tide Pen. Everyone needs a Tide Pen. They're great. But what we really can't leave the house without, what you have to add to your EDC, is the armor of God. Phone, wallet, keys, armor of God. We have to have the armor of God every single day. It's not optional. It's not like, well, I'm going to take a day off today. I'm not going to get in a spiritual battle today. We need the armor of God every day. So there in Ephesians chapter 6, uh, we're going to try to go through uh, verses about 10 uh, to about 18. And it's funny, you might be thinking, oh, okay, great, you know, eight verses, we can do that. Or you might be thinking, no, they're, they're too, there's too much there. And I heard one teaching uh, that someone taught all of Ephesians 5 and 6 in 45 minutes. And I heard another teaching that it was just the sword of the Spirit for an hour. So I don't know. Let's see uh, if we can find somewhere in the middle. What's amazing about the armor of God is that this is not the first time we see this armor. It actually comes up in the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. And it comes up in an amazing place in Isaiah chapter 59. It comes up in a messianic prophecy, talking about Jesus wearing armor. And it says, uh, verse 17, For he, Jesus, put on righteousness as a breastplate, and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on the garments of vengeance for clothing, and was clad with zeal as a cloak. I think that's amazing. The same armor that, that's talked about, part of it at least, the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, Jesus the Messiah wears there in the prophecy in Isaiah 59. And one takeaway, if you're going to leave right now, or if you're going to fall asleep or something, is all of our Bible reading, it points us to Jesus. Everything we read in the scriptures, it points us to Jesus. Even the armor of God, it points us to Jesus. Uh, it's awesome. And it's also not the last time for the helmet of salvation in particular. It comes up again in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 8. It says, But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love. So a little bit different there, but then it says, And as a helmet, the hope of salvation. So the armor of God is not just, oh, it's that Ephesians chapter 6 passage. This is throughout the Bible. It's in the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, and then in the later epistles as well. And if we start reading there in verse 11, Ephesians chapter 6. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. One thing I want to point out as well before we really get into it is that we're not told to be really good with a sword. We're not told to learn all the tactics per se. We're not, all we are told or the thing that we're told the most three times in this passage is stand, stand, stand. Even if you can't lift your arms, even if you feel that you're gonna drop your shield, even if your helmet's on crooked, your visor's in front of your eyes, whatever it is, stand, stand, stand. You fall down, you stand. You drop something, you pick it up, you stand. I, I need that, I, I need that encouragement i need that simplicity just stand it comes up in verse 11 and 13 and 14 and before we get into it see this this is why it's going to be hard to get through eight verses before we get into it again i, I wanted to talk about one thing in particular and that's satan's nature versus god's nature and i thought that was important i thought that was helpful to the passage Again, if you know martial arts, if you know warfare, if you know anything like that, there's a, a study that you do, right? There's an observation, you know, what are the tactics? Even there in verse 11, wiles, it's the Greek word methodia, 
methods, the methods of the devil, the schemes of the enemy. We're not unaware, it says, that we may be able to stand against the schemes, the methods, the wiles of the devil. Right? So there's methods. You don't want to give the enemy too much credit, but you also don't want to brush them off or blow them off. This enemy, thousands of years old, millennia old, they've been studying humanity. They have methods. They lay traps. They lay sieges. They shoot far. They do hand-to-hand. I mean, there are methods. And, and there's, a, there's a, a character. There's a... Well, let me, let me just explain. So the, that word devil... It's the Greek diabolos, di- diabolos. Diablo, right? In Spanish, we know that word. So the Spanish is a carryover from the Greek. The Greek is diabolos. And it literally means to throw through. In essence, it means slanderer, accuser. The, the name, the Greek name devil, literally means slanderer, accuser. Slanderer and accuser. And this is the character of Satan. It's totally in contrast with the character of God. In Exodus chapter 34, verses 6 and 7, it says, And the Lord passed before him, Moses, and proclaimed, quote, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving inequity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. Now, I want to point something out here. If you're really, really, really picking apart some of these verses, for the longest time I thought, man, that's, that seems kind of strange. It says he keeps mercies for thousands, but he visits the iniquity of the fathers on their children to their third and fourth grandchildren. The comparison is this. It's actually not a weird insert into the really amazing, gracious name of God. It's part of the gracious name of God. He keeps mercy for thousands, parentheses, of generations, and only visits the iniquity of three or four generations. So so it's talking about God's mercy. Every word of that scripture is talking about God's mercy and patience and long-suffering. That's who God is. He's not an accuser. He's not a slanderer. In John chapter 8, verse 44, uh, this is Jesus speaking to the Pharisees. You are of your father the devil. The diabolos and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources or his own nature. For he is a liar and the father of it. Total contrast to God. God is truth. God speaks truth. You don't believe me? John chapter 14 verse 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way. The truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You know, if you ever get a chance to, to, to dive into the scriptures, to study the original languages, I love John 14, 6. I am the way. It says, I, even I, only I am the way and the truth and the life. It's very emphatic. John chapter 14, verse 6 is so emphatic. It's just, I read it in English and I'm like, oh. And, and, and I, you know, I hear it read out loud and I'm like, oh, no, I just kinda, there's more. Than, oh, you know. Uh, anyways, it's Bible nerd stuff. Um, but uh, contrary to, to the, the devil, the devil, devil's a father of lies. Jesus said, I am the truth. Even Jesus does this contrast. Right, I didn't come up with this. John chapter 10, verse 10. The thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I have come that they may have life, and then they may have it more abundantly. I'm reading a, a kid's book. It's one of the best books I've ever read, though. Uh, it's, um, it's called Little Pilgrim's Big Journey. Pastor Zach has actually mentioned it from the pulpit before a, a long time ago. And I kind of rediscovered it. Where did that quote go? There it is. Um, so it's a children's rendition of Pilgrim's Progress. Pilgrim's Progress. It's so good. Um, <clears throat> and there's this scene in there. And it says, Apollyon laughs. So Christian, uh, little pilgrim, little Christian. The illustrations are great. It's just great. It's great. Everybody should have it if you have kids. Or if you don't have kids. It's beautiful cover. Okay. Little Christian, little pilgrim, uh, he's going along his journey. Eventually, he gets to the point where there's this big dragon called Apollyon. 
It says, Apollyon laughed, but you don't really serve the king. You disobeyed him many times. First you fell into the bog of despair, then you strayed from the path, you were lazy and slept too long, and almost turned back when you saw the lions. You don't seem to love the king at all. (laughs) All this is true, said Christian, and much more that you left out. But the prince whom I serve is merciful and ready to forgive all who serve him. I love that. That's me. You know, that when, I, when, I'm, when I'm getting accused and, and the, the forces of darkness are just beating me up or I'm just listening to my own negative thoughts or whatever lies, and, and when I finally can come up for air, I'm like, yeah, that's all true. There's, there's a lot more you haven't listed, but, but God still loves me. But God is still good and, and God still pursues me and, and God's still providing for me and kind of can't fight that, you know. And it makes me love him more and it makes me want to run from whatever that thing is and run to him. Just love that book. Everybody get it. <clears throat> you know, and, and I wanted to, to say one more thing before we get into these pieces of armor. When you talk about the devil as an accuser, as a slanderer, there's one person that the devil accuses and slanders more than anyone. And it's God. That's what he's doing when he tempts us to sin. When the devil tempts you to sin, he's saying God isn't worth it. He's accusing God. When the devil's uh, tempting you to turn your back, to, to forsake Christ, to compromise, he's saying, oh, God's not looking. God's not omnipresent. God's not all-knowing. God's not who he says he is. You can get away with this. He's accusing God. He accuses God night and day. If you're familiar with the story of Job, right, that's, that's an insight into the spiritual realm. He was, he was looking, looking for who he, could, who he could attack, who he could accuse. And then he said it, didn't he, to Job? He said, he said, oh, no, he only loves you because of these things, or he only loves you because he's healthy, or he only loves you because he has his kids. And God said, take his health, take his kids, take everything and watch. He's still going to love me. He's still going to serve me. And if you know the story of Job, even his own wife what did his wife tell him? Why don't you just curse God and die? And I, I read that, and I don't think she was this naggy, like, why don't you just curse God and die already? I think she saw her husband suffering. I think she saw him on the verge of death and sick, his skin falling off, their children dead. And she said, just end this. If, if you curse God, would this stop? Is there some way out of this? I think, I think she was just watching him suffer. And I think, and he said, you know, he said she was foolish for that. Don't say that. So the devil wants to accuse God. So just know that that's on the line. It's not just about you. It's not just about your testimony or, or if you fell or not or if you compromised or not. You're representing the Lord. Satan's accusing God. So let's jump into it. Verse 12, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Uh, A scripture that uh, says the same thing, that gives us more information, Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 through 15 And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. He has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Now, this is the key part of this verse here, verse 15. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them triumphing over them in it. So here in Ephesians 6, it says, we're doing warfare against principalities and powers. There's, there's, there's demons of high rank given uh, authority over cities and neighborhoods, and they're, they're consuming people with crime and drugs and, and sin, and there's places that you go and you just feel oppression and it feels heavy, and, and areas of our country and areas of the world where children are trafficked and nobody cares, and then there's people, there's areas of the world in India where rats eat grain. Rats eat food that's meant for humans, but they can't can't kill rats and so the humans go hungry while the rats eat and there's cows to eat but they can't eat cows because cows carry uh, divinity in them and all this is going on in different parts of the world but God says that he actually has disarmed them 
and he made them look like dummies at the cross. He made a spectacle of them, a show. And so we still battle, but we have to know that we're battling from a place of victory. Jesus has conquered. Jesus, one day, again, it's one of my favorite things in the Bible, that one day death will die. Death is going to be cast into the bottomless pit. It's going to cease to exist. Jesus, Jesus is just waiting. God has a perfect time for all this. We continue reading in verse 13, and we get to it. Therefore, in light of all this, because of all that we've said, not just in chapter 6, but in chapter 5 about how to walk as a Christian, and in and, and chapter 3 of Ephesians, about the mystery of Christ and, 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 and how we're to, to awe, be in awe of Christ, grace in chapter 2 and, and spiritual wisdom in chapter 1. In light of all this, therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Verse 14, stand therefore having girded your waist with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness. There's another uh, scripture uh, from the Hebrew Bible. It says, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 3, Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. And if you've uh, been around Jewish people before, been to Israel, you know that they have uh, these, these threads, these blue and white strings. The Hebrew word, it it's, <laughs> sounds funny. I don't know how to pronounce it. Tzitzit. Uh, Tzitzit. T-Z-I-T. Z-I-T. Tzitzit. Um, so phylacteries are the, the black boxes, the leather wrappings, the tzitzit are the threads. And Numbers 15 talks about them. And again, it's just this idea of truth being around your waist, truth being around your neck, wear truth, put it around you. Speak to the children of Israel, Numbers 15. Tell them to make tassels on the corners of their garments throughout their generations to put a blue thread in the tassels of the corners and you shall have the tassel that may, you may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord and do them that you may not follow the harlot tree to which your own heart and your own eyes are inclined and that you may remember to do all the commandments and be holy for your God. And so this idea of having truth around our waist. In ancient times, the, the seed of the emotions was the belly, right? You would say something like, I love you with all my bowels to your, to your honey, right? Those of you that are married, you know, maybe try that this week. I love you with all my bowels, honey. Uh, pretend like you're an ancient Israel. And uh, so that's the seed of emotion. And I was actually talking to a brother today, and look, I get it, right? Maybe this is not super manly or whatever. It is what it is. My emotions can be overwhelming, right? And I need to put truth over that. I need to speak truth to that. I need to think truth. I need to hear truth when my emotions are just bubbling up in my belly, right? I need to, I need to have truth around my waist to govern me, to lead me. And... and if you think about the armor, what holds all this stuff together tightly to you? Truth, God's word. We, we're going to see the word of the spirit, but the truth of God, it holds everything together. It holds everything tight. It has to be all encompassed with truth. And then we get to the next piece. Having put on the, bless, the breastplate, the blessed breastplate, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. We read it already, talking about Jesus in Psalm 40, verse 10. It says, I have not hidden your righteousness within my heart. I have declared your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your loving kindness and your truth from the assembly. I found a, another verse that I thought was really interesting, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. So it says, breastplate of righteousness, and then in verse 8 of uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, it says, Finally there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. I wonder, this is total conjecture, you can just throw this out, I hope it doesn't bother anyone or stumble anyone, I wonder if we're going to trade in this armor for crowns. You know, you get, you get to heaven, you're done fighting. You turn over your gear and you get your crown. Ah, oh, man, I, that just seems like heaven, you know. I love that. I love that. You know, if, if you do, you don't have to raise your hand or anything. Don't, don't look around. If you do EDC self-defense stuff, right, it's going to be a good day when we can, we can lay all that down, right? 
It's going to be a good day. But so the breastplate of righteousness. Now, it's kind of interesting. In ancient times, the, the seed of the emotions was in the belly, but the will, the willpower, the kind of intention came from the heart, right? And I don't, have, I don't even understand the whole difference necessarily, but there was this kind of distinction where you might will to do something, but your emotions are different, or you might want something, but your emo- there's this, and I think we experience that in modern times, but they had a very kind of clear distinction in ancient times. And so the seed of the will, the intentions, was the heart. And so may our intentions be righteous. May the things we want be righteous. May our, may our ideas and our thoughts be righteous. Right? We're going to get to our, our, our helmet, but that our heart, right? That it's the breastplate of righteousness. And, and again, you think of kind of the, the front and center of everything you do, right? Whether it's business, whether it's school, whether it's friendships, whether it's relationships, whatever it is, that it's righteousness. It's, it's the first thing is righteousness, the breastplate of righteousness. And then it continue, continues in verse 15. And having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Another scripture that coincides with this one, Romans chapter 10, verses 14 and 15. How then shall they call on him who they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him who they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. And so again, that's Romans chapter 10, and our feet shod with the gospel of peace. And you know what I take away from that, among other things, is that when we walk around, when we go about our day, that we're thinking of the gospel, right? If I'm going to walk into a store, can I share the gospel? If I'm going to walk to, you know, wherever it is, if I'm walking into work, right, am, am I taking the gospel with me? Am I thinking about sharing the gospel? Or are there places where I go that the gospel's not there? Because that's, that's no bueno, if I'm walking into a nightclub, if I'm walking into a place to get drugs, if I'm walking into a situation of immorality, I'm not bringing the gospel. So everywhere I go, I should be able to wear the gospel, bring the gospel with me. And again, how beautiful are the, the feet, uh, what does it say here? The feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. If you've never led someone to the Lord, man, you're missing out on like probably the most exciting thing in life. To bring the gospel of peace, to be able to talk with someone and, and kind of lead them through some questions and, and, and get their response and, and see that they're ready and see that God is moving and say, hey, would you like to pray? Do you want to pray to receive Jesus? Do you, do you want to be saved now? Do you, I, I, can, I can pray with you. And then for them to receive the gospel of peace, man, it's amazing. So may we have our feet shod. Or, you know, they, they would wear these big old metal kind of overlays, right? That's what it means, shod, right? Put that thing on. And then it continues in verse 16. Above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. AV team, I'm going to throw you for a loop here for a second. So one of the cool things about um, a shield, and especially in ancient times, different um, armies over history had different size shields. But Roman legionaries' shields were pretty big. They were pretty big. They were, they were nearly the entire length of the body. They were, they were rectangle or oval shaped. And you could get behind that thing and be completely invisible behind that shield. You could be completely covered behind your shield if you were a Roman legionary in the first few uh, centuries. And so when, you're, when you can't get that belt on, I, I just, I, the truth, I'm, I'm wrestling, I'm struggling. Righteousness, man, I failed. My breastplate, I left it at home. I'm all over the place, you know? It's gonna talk about the helmet of salvation in a second, but, but all else fails. I'm just, God, I'm, I'm just putting my faith in you, God, please. God, all I have is just faith in you. I, I've, I've got nothing. And you hide behind that shield. It's awesome. It's an awesome thing, the shield of faith. And, and I mentioned it earlier. It says, you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Listen, the devil's armies, they've got snipers. 
They've got snipers in that army. And they're just, they're, you're just minding your own business. You're just going to the grocery store and out of nowhere, temptation. You know, somebody cuts you off, whatever. Temptation to be angry. You know, temptation towards lust or immorality or, or, or temptation towards addiction. You're in the grocery store and you're like, hey, I'm going to go down this aisle, this aisle. Okay, who put the beer here? What's going on? You know? And just temptation, just boom, out of nowhere, sniper shot. But if you have your shield of faith, right? If you're, if you're, listen, if you're really struggling, maybe you need to act some of this stuff out, right? Maybe you're in the grocery store and you're just walking by. I'm just, I'm, got my shield of faith. God, help me, you know, cover me. You know, walking past the aisle of whatever it is. Everybody's going to look at you weird, you know. Would you like to hear the gospel? <laughs> and then you, t- you tell them. But um, if you have the shield of faith, you can quench those fiery darts. Verse 17, take the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation. And again, this is kind of self-explanatory, I think. I think it makes sense to us. Right, our mind, our thought life, right, what governs that salvation. You know, I, I originally shared this with the students at LHM, this, this passage, this teaching. And uh, I thought it was helpful for them. I think it's helpful for adults, you know. Ask yourself, before you're going to do something dumb, ask yourself, would a saved person do this? <laughs> Think, I'm saved. Would a saved person do this? I mean, maybe that's, just, maybe that's just me, that I need to ask myself that sometimes. You, you're, God, I'm saved. I'm a child of God. I know who I am. I can think about salvation. I can think about what you've done for me. And I can wear that on my head and have that on my mind. You know, again, this, this same brother I was talking with earlier, he just got me talking. I was, I'd been praying for the, preparing for the teaching, so I had a lot to talk about, you know. And um, I lost my train of thought, but he's a blessing. Okay. Uh, wow, that was crazy. Helmet of salvation. And take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And, uh, you know, actually, I, I kind of skipped over some stuff here. I wanted to give you a lot of scriptures about the helmet. Because, again, it, it's interesting. I, looking for different scriptures, trying to get correlating scriptures. There was a lot of stuff about helmet and mind. And, and I think that so much of what we struggle with, it's just in the mind. And this is what I mean by that. And I don't mean to be disrespectful. I'm I'm trying to make a point. I'm, I'm trying to be helpful. We use this term, we sometimes say this, we say, I fell into sin, right? I fell into this thing. Someone, there's an issue of sexual morality, addiction, um, you punch someone in the face, Right? I fell and I punched them in the face. Right? No, just kidding. But you might come and, and talk to a Christian person and use Christian language and say, hey, I fell. I fell into this sin. I get that. I understand what you're trying to say. But you didn't go from here to there. Right? That's like a hundred yard fall. Right? Is it, am I tracking with anyone? Right? That, that's a long, I felt like, wait, I, didn't, I was having a nice time and then I punched the guy in the face. That's, that's a big gap of behavior. Right, So what I'm trying to say is, I made a comment, I wanted to explain it. When I say that so much of what we struggle with is in our mind, when it's getting there, right? let's go back to the grocery store, somebody was rude in the grocery store, whatever it is. When you're like, oh, Lord, I got be, to beat this now. I, I got to beat this right now. God, I got to conquer this. Lord Jesus, help me. I'm being tempted to sin. Remember, what did Jesus say? If you've hated someone, if you hate someone, if you call them a, a, a name, a nasty name, I'm, I'm paraphrasing the, the, the Bible passage, if you call them a nasty name, you've already committed murder. So God, I'm, 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 I might be sinning right now. Lord, help me. God, help me. And then you don't end up punching someone in the face. Right? That's what I'm saying. A lot of it starts in our minds. So look at these scriptures. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Colossians chapter 3, verse 2. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. For God has given us, not, excuse me, not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, Arm yourselves also with the same mind. 
For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. I love that last verse because it brings us back to the armor. Arm yourselves with the same mind. Arm yourselves. Put on your armor. Put on your helmet of salvation. Awesome. We get to the sword of the spirit. This comes up again in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. I really love this verse for a lot of reasons. You think of the sword of the spirit piercing even the soul and the spirit. And that's the most uh, unknowable thing. Right? I mean, where does the soul and the spirit stop and start and what, you know, and how to, that's what, that's what the Bible verse is saying here. Even, even that, that you're narrow, you little human brains, right? I'm talking to myself. Joey's little human brains, not even ever going to figure this stuff out. But God's word can cut, right? Right? Fine line right through it. A fine line through soul and spirit. It can get to where it needs to get to. It can do what it needs to do. God's word. God's living word. You know, you might have noticed, you might know this already, this is our only offensive weapon on the list. Everything else has been protective armor. This is our only offensive weapon is our sword. You know, I'm going to read some verses here, but one thing I think of is that's because we, we, we shouldn't be going to look for a fight with the enemy, right? You're not like, you're not 100 yards away and you're like, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shoot him with an arrow or whatever. No, he's over there, I'm going over here. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't need to go anywhere near there, but if, if, he squ- if you got to square up, you got your sword right if he's in your face you got your sword right and so that's one thing that i kind of take away from that some bible verses on this uh psalm 18 verse 34 he teaches my hands to make war so that my arms can bend a bow of bronze blessed be the lord my rock this is psalm 144 blessed be the lord my rock who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle you know there's this amazing story in judges one of the judges early on, it said that he fought so long and so hard that his hand stuck to his sword. Has any actual show of hands? Has anybody ever experienced something where you've gripped something so long your hand is stuck like that? I've never experienced that. Yeah, I gotta ask you guys after. That's intense, man. It said his hand was stuck to his sword. He couldn't open it. And so God teaches us how to fight. And listen, we have some some more to get through here, but. Uh, so it's not in closing. I'm not even close to closing. But, but I will end on time. But in the, the spirit of closing, no, I'm just kidding, sorry. <laughs> in getting to the point that I still want to make more points, guys, the, the battle is tough. The battle, I've been in battles in my personal life, my spiritual life, where it feels like a slug vest. You know, again, if you, if you know martial arts, if you know fighting, oh, my hands are down, I'm getting slapped around, and my punchers are this, you know, I'm, form is gone, my, I'm not protecting myself, I mean, I'm just, I'm biting, I'm whatever. It's just nasty. That, that battle that day was nasty. But I fought. I swung back. I got knocked down, I got up. I called somebody and said, I can't get up, come help me. You know, I've done that. Like, dude, I don't, I don't have an answer for this. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Give me a Bible or so, whatever. Like, sorry, I mean, I'm, I don't know if I'm going to be asked to teach again. I, I don't mean to, I'm just super, super nervous now saying that. I didn't mean that disrespectfully. I just mean, I've been there, right? I've been there. When you're just so hard, so dry, it could be nasty. It could be tough, um, right? And again, that's, that's, I thought of all that with, with, with the sword um, there in Judges. But God can equip us. God can strengthen us. You know, you think of um, revival, right? You want want revival in the city, right? And I know some of you do. We've prayed together. Oh, we want to see God move in Miami. You want revival in our church. Oh, we want more people to come to the church, you know? That's a good prayer, right? Sometimes we're nervous, like, oh, it's not about numbers. It's not. We just, we want people to come to the Lord, right? This church, whatever church, come on, go over there. Let's just get to churches, whatever, you know, the, the bookstore thing, right, is, it's a tough one, but we, we need more space. And so we, 
if I, I think this is an accurate summary. I hope I'm rep- representing the pastor as well. The summary is kind of like, we're going to move out some books to make space for people. <laughs> you know, we, there's people that need to sit down. So we're going to move the books for now. We're going to put people there and maybe we'll put the books back later. Uh, but if you want all that, if you want personal revival, it's God's word. It's the sword of the spirit. And, and God uh, will, will cut through our hearts. He, he will um, deal with us, right? When, when you get to the fact that God uses that sword, it becomes more like a scalpel. He becomes more like a surgeon. And he does the surgery that he needs to do. And again, I'm just kind of tangent at this point but again I was talking earlier I mentioned it on the radio sometimes we go to God as a physician and we say hey I want this surgery done and he goes actually we're going to do this one you know there's a story I think it was Pastor Chuck Smith a guy that got saved and and he, he was a smoker he smoked a lot of cigarettes and he wanted to quit smoking he knew it was bad for him he knew you know God didn't want that for him so he tried he tried he tried God help me God deliver me God take the cigarettes away didn't happen and he was really discouraged struggling and I, I don't remember the end of the story, right? I shouldn't even have started it. I don't know if he, <laughs> I don't know if he had a, a swearing problem specifically or if it was some undisclosed other problem. But there was this other character issue that he had, and that was gone. That had been dealt with. That had been healed by the Lord. And, and God kind of ministered to this guy. This is a story I'm repeating now from 70 years ago or whatever. So who knows? Maybe it was a kid or something. But <laughs> Whatever. God ministered to this guy and he said, look, I know you want the smoking gone. We're going to take care of that eventually. But I wanted to do this first. Right? He took the scalpel to this area. And then God, God knows what he's doing. You know? And so continuing on the tangent, we need to be gracious to one another. Right? If you see somebody coming in and they're not you know, the perfect Christian in your head or whatever, God's working on them. They're here. Pray for them. Encourage them. Love them. Reach out to them. And also, you're not the perfect Christian either. So... Me neither. But, uh, but we should be sanctified. We should be growing. And God will do it. Speaking of, check out this verse. Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. James chapter 4 verse 7. You know, speaking about revival. Again, that just kind of came up as, as I was studying. It's, it's, it's not, you know, sort of related here as we're going through the armor. But you have... A whole uh, psalm dedicated to God's word, Psalm 119. And in that psalm in verse 37, it says, Turn my eyes away from looking at worthless things and revive me in your way. I, I love that verse. I need that verse. Turn my eyes away from looking at worthless things. I love the, the, the use of the word there. It doesn't say evil, nasty things. No, there's some things that are just worthless. They do me no profit. They do God no profit. They, they do nothing for others. Just a waste of time, energy, and resources. It's worthless. It won't, it's not going to pay dividends in heaven, you know. It's going to burn. It's just amazing. And revive me in your way. Uh, last thing on, on the word, the sword of the spirit. There's a quote from Charles Spurgeon. I like this. Scripture's like a lion. Whoever heard of defending a lion? Just let it loose and it will defend itself. I love that. I love that. You know, again, I love to share the word with people. We shouldn't share the word with people. But you don't need to get all flustered, right, when people attack the Bible. Right? They're, they're attacking the living and eternal word of God that has stood from ages past to eternity forever. It's, they're they're, they're going to lose. They're going to lose bad. Um, but you don't want them to lose. So you pray for them, right? But you, you don't need to get all upset. Just let it loose. I love that. And then we get to verse 18. And you think the armor is done, and it is, right? In context, specifically, the pieces of armor have been listed. But then he says, verse 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. This is the most important thing. This is the most important thing. You know, you think again of the picture. You think again of the... um, metaphor that God's giving us here, the picture that God's giving us here. If this is in fact a soldier with armor on, have you ever heard of a one soldier army? Honest question. Raise your hand. I never have. I'm not trying to be funny or like get people in trouble. Okay. Couple people have. Cool. I don't know if that was like video game or what, 
But when, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe. Most of us haven't. The majority of us never heard of that. It's not very common, a one-soldier army. So if, if again, you're looking at the picture God is giving us, there, there's, there's got to be support there. There's orders going back and forth from the battlefield. There's a command structure. Prayer. That prayer is everything else, right, in this metaphor. Prayer needs to cover everything. Prayer needs to go before everything. Prayer goes before the battle. Prayer comes behind us from people that are supporting us. Prayer for the people alongside of us in the battle. Prayer, prayer, prayer. Uh, look at all the, the different types of prayers. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, spirit, being watchful with all perseverance and supplication. That's like five, six different types of prayer, right? And, and, and modes of prayer and aspects of prayer. It's a lot of prayer. And I don't pray that much. And many of us don't. And we should. You know, I, prayer is just one of those things. It's just one of those things that you just don't know until you do it, right? Um, I have this quote here, and, and I, I was really going back and forth about, about reading it. But I, I feel like it, it gives a um, kind of meat to this a little bit. Because we can be here. Look, again. Being transparent, I've heard so many messages on prayer. I've been encouraged. I've been convicted about prayer. I haven't changed my prayer life that much. I've not heeded as well as I could. I want to change. I'm, I'm, this is the third or fourth time I'm hearing myself say this, so I'm going to change some stuff. Uh, I've started to change some stuff. You know, I, I look at Tiff back there because you, if you're married, you, that, that spouse is going to know more than anyone. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, just, it's one of those things that you just kind of, Double dutch. You just gotta kind of. You just kind of gotta jump. You jump in and then you find your rhythm. You know, and I'm like, oh, is it in the morning? Is it in the morning? Do we hold hands? Do I? Where are you going? Is it the kid? Do we start praying for the kids? I don't know. What about other people? There's somebody sick. Oh, you know, and it's just like just jump in. So I'm like, I'm just praying, and Lord, and there's this other thing, Lord, and there's the Lord, and then right, and then I just fell asleep. Right? I we held hands though. <laughs> but it, you just gotta go for it. You just gotta go for it, and then. What I have found is that God encourages you. God meets you in prayer, you know. If you start there falling asleep, you know, praying, maybe next time you'll be a little bit more awake. Maybe next time you'll be alert, <laughs> actually conscious, you know. And God encourages you and God strengthens you. And it's kind of this snowball effect when you start praying. Um, you know, I was, I was talking, we're, we're in a pastor's meeting and, and talking about prayer. And, and, and different pastors are in different seasons and in all these messages and all these encouragements I've heard about prayer over the years, it's always been said how prayer, man, prayer, you, you pray and it, the ministry and the work of God and, and what God does is just an overflow of prayer. It's just an overflow. You know, we, there's these classic, I didn't even find this one. I've, I've heard it so many times. I mean that in a good way. It's like we should know it. You know, the, the, the old dead guy, amazing preacher would pray six hours before he did two hours of work or whatever. It was, it, the numbers are actually that flip-flop. It was incredible. I should have had it. Point is, it was all an overflow, you know. And, uh, and so we were praying, you know, as, as, as pastors. And, and I, I was praying and I realized, man, I expect so much more. I, I expect to see more in this person's life. I expect more to happen because they're praying more. Does that make sense? They're, they're doing less. They're in a different season of life. Their schedule's different, but they're praying more. And I'm like, it just has to. It just has to happen. We're going to see the work of God flow through this person's life because they're just praying all the time. And I, that, that just realization just kind of came to me, and I'm super excited for that. Um, so, so here's the thing that I think kind of gives meat to it. So you guys may know this person. The reason I only mention their name, number one, is to just give some real, real, context to this example number two we can continue to pray for them they're they're kind of a famous up-and-coming person uh andrew huberman andrew huberman some of you might know the name uh, he's a neuroscientist and tenured professor in the department of neurobiology and by courtesy psychiatry and behavioral science at stanford school of medicine he has a really popular podcast i can't vouch for the entire podcast and every episode but here is something that he said i'm going to read it as i wrote it so i don't mess it up Andrew Huberman on a podcast talking about his habit of praying to God. The host asks him, has it given you peace? Dr. Huberman then says, quote, my goodness, it's given me so much peace. And you know, it's going to sound weird. People are probably going to be like, what are you talking about? But it works. It works. There's a way. This, this is the part that really stuck out to me. 
there's a way in which certain things I was grappling with, I just couldn't resolve. I couldn't do it. It was all internal, and I just couldn't do it. That's a quote from this guy that tells people how to optimize your sleep, your nutrition, your working out, your brain chemistry, your, your hormones. He has an answer for everything, li- almost literally everything, because he, you know, he says on his podcast that the brain is connected to every other system of the body, so he has an answer for everything. And he said there was things he couldn't resolve until he started praying. I, that impacted me. I'm like, man, I, I got to, I, I, Lord, you know, I should be praying. That, that impacted me. Another quote, and I love this. I think I'm almost certain this was from this last uh, East Coast Pastors Conference. Somebody said, you haven't done anything until you've prayed. You haven't done anything until you've prayed. Again, super convicting, super convicting. Prayer is indispensable and absolutely necessary for the Christian. Prayer is indispensable and absolutely necessary for the church. Again, if if this is your home church, we need to be a praying church. You know, we don't have anything formalized yet, but, but maybe you get here early and you pray. Maybe you come, you sit down early, you pray. You know, you sit next to somebody. Hey, how you doing? Week looks good. Cool, cool. Hey, we got five minutes. Let's pray for let's pray for a couple minutes before service starts. Let's pray for the pastor. Let's pray they let him teach again. No, I'm, just uh, I'm I'm so humbled to even be asked ever even once. But um, pray, 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 pray. So, actually, in closing, worship team can come up. Remember, guys, your EDC, phone, wallet, keys armor of God. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for uh, this uh, chapter. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your word, God. Thank you that, uh, again, it says, be strong in the power of his might. God, it's all your strength. It's all you, Lord. It's your power. Uh, God, um, we just stand, and we even stand by your grace, Lord. Um, But thank you, God, that we we have orders. We know what to do. We know where to stand. We know how to fight. So God, I I just want to pray right now for anyone here that they're having that kind of week, that it is a slugfest, that they're getting beat up. Uh, God, that they don't have strength to stand, that they don't have strength to fight. Um, God, whether it's, it's, it's sin, they're just sinning, God, and they're failing and failing, God, whether it's, it's in the thought life, God, it's depression, anxiety, uh, God, self-doubt, God, uh, uh, crisis of faith, God, whatever the battle is right now, uh, Lord Jesus, we just pray. We pray that you encourage this brother or sister. We pray, uh, God, that you strengthen them, that they would get up, that they would, that they would like that little pilgrim in our story, that they would say, you don't know the half of it, devil. And still Jesus forgives me. Still Jesus loves me. Still God welcomes me into his celestial city. So we just pray for this brother or sister. God, if they're here now and they're, they're ready to pray with someone, may they come up forward right now as the pastors come forward, Lord. May they turn around aside to a friend, a brother or sister that's sitting next to them. Pray with them, Lord God, please. And we continue to pray for our church, Lord, for Pastor Zach and his family as they travel, God, for all that you have planned for us in this season. And again, we just, we just bless you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.